Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Lucille Karatsis, and I'm a licensed clinical social worker in Florida. Uh, from moved here five years ago from New Hampshire, where I worked for over 30 years, and I uh, worked my, primarily with the elderly and their families. So um, memory issues came up all the time. Uh, and when I first started working, it was theoretical. Uh, now it's not so theoretical anymore. Um, so, um, first thing to think about is that um, having memory issues as we get older is, fr is normal, but still frustrating. So that's why we want to spend some time talking about this today. So this program is brought to you from, by TLC Services, and we appreciate NASW's hosting us for this event. And I'm going to move my mouse so it's out of the way. Um, and a little bit about TLC. I, I joined um, this, well, actually was one of the founders of the group about three years ago. And there are 20 of us retired mental health professionals. Um, we are all licensed and insured. And what we provide are trainings, support groups, so, I'm sorry, support groups um, such as um, grief support groups, weight loss support, um, cognitive parts of the weight loss support, uh, family caregiver issues. We do presentations like we are doing today. We have been doing them throughout the community up until these COVID times. And through the social isolation that's been required, we have been learning and doing uh, many presentations through Zoom. And so this is a new technology for many of us. Uh, we certainly have learned a lot in the last few months about doing presentations and doing them on Zoom. I miss seeing everyone as I'm talking, so it's a little bit of a challenge. Uh, and technology is always a challenge. So I'm sure you'll be patient with us if we have any uh, difficulties. We also do some one-on-one -on -one counseling. And the counseling that we do is brief counseling, uh, not to be in competition with people who are providing counseling services, but really for, for people who may not have full DSM diagnoses, but are struggling with normal age-related changes um, grief, loss, things of that nature, and anxiety. Um, we provide four to six sessions, and then, if necessary, make referrals out into the community. Okay, Because we are all volunteers, um, we do not charge for our services, but we do ask for a small donation. Our malpractice insurance is covered by United Way, and so we have limited expenses, but we do have some uh, telephone, printing, et cetera, expenses. And I'd like to thank uh, NASW, and I'd also like to thank Bonnie Hovel and her husband, David, who has done a great job in training us and getting us up to speed with technology. Next slide, please. So our objectives or goals for today are to look at the difference between age-related memory changes versus dementia, factors influence, influencing memory, and how memory can be improved and managed. It's a three-part presentation, and after the first part, we will have a question and answer and hopefully an interactive commentary uh, about what we've been talking about. There's a lot of... Um, expertise in this, I was going to say room, but I guess it's in this Zoom. Uh, so I'd like to tap your experience as well, uh, not just a didactic uh, presentation today. A little harder to do on um, Zoom, but hopefully by having two Q&As, we'll have an opportunity to do a little bit more of that. I'm hoping that this information that we talk about today will be beneficial to you personally, to those that um, you interact with, family, friends, neighbors, as well as your clients. 
Let's start with making a couple of very important points. All older people do not have significant memory problems. It may appear that that is not true, but if you look at the general population, the average older adult does just fine memory-wise. Uh, dementia is a, um, an illness that has a set of symptoms, but normal age-relating changes are very much in the normal range. Yes, we are a little slower to register information and also to retrieve information, but that doesn't mean that we all have significant memory problems. Uh, a good example that I like to use, and I pretty soon will be outdated, I'm gonna to have to change my metaphor to uh, computer gigabytes, I suppose, but the metaphor I like is that of a file cabinet. If you are eight years of age, the amount of information that you may have in your brain as compared to um, a, a file cabinet might fill a drawer, maybe two. When you get to be older in your 60s, 70s, and 80s and above, the amount of data that you have in your brain probably would fill several rooms of file cabinets. So retrieving information that's in the 20th file drawer may take a little bit longer, but it's there and it is retrievable. Now it may, it will take you longer and it may be misfiled. And so at that particular moment, you may not be able to access it, but it is still there and it's, it is retrievable. That's a big difference between normal aging and dementia. Older memories are easier to retrieve. Now, why would that be? You would think that older memories would be harder because they're, they're so old. Well, if you think about the brain as having pathways, similar to the pathway to your neighbor's house, for instance, if you have walked that path many times, there's a groove there that will guide you on your next journey. Well, our memories are very similar to that. Older memories have been revisited many times, and so they become more ingrained. They get attached to other memories so that when you're remembering this uh, event, it may um, piggyback on another, and so both of those things get uh, ingrained, and so they are easier to remember. They are also, um, are, some of our older memories are more important, perhaps. You know, people say, you know, I can remember all the words to super fragile, yeah, expialidocious. <laughs> anyway, whatever that was, that song was, but I can't remember uh, where my next door neighbor um, came from originally. Well, you know, you probably heard the Mary Poppins song many times. Um, it's also using different parts of your brain because it's music, it's language, um, it's visual. Um, so those things are a little bit easier to retrieve. Older people also are far more aware of being forgetful. Um, a 16 or 18 year old person that cannot find the keys to their car will simply shrug it off and say, um, gee, where did I put them? Oh yeah, I'll, I'll, I, I know I'll find them later. Somebody in our age, my age category, I'm not going to assume everybody watching me is in the same age uh, group, but an older person will say, oh my gosh, it's the beginning of dementia. I can't find my keys calm us, ourselves down a little bit and be aware that our awareness brings it more, uh, makes it more real. Uh, another analogy that I like to use on that is um, when, when I bought a, um, a red car, it seemed to me right after I purchased my red car, there were a lot more red cars on the road. Well, the truth of the matter is there are always a lot of red cars. I was just not aware of it. 
now that I'm aware of it, and now that I have it, I'm much more tuned into it. So the final point to set the stage for today's talk is that being forgetful by itself is not dementia. Dementia is more than problems with memory. Next slide, please. Okay. As I said, although moments of forgetfulness are normal, they are still frustrating. There are some normal physiological, physiological changes that happen with age, such as mental and physical flexibility. If you think about yourselves, or when I think about myself, I used to have no difficulty whatsoever getting on the floor to play with my grandchildren. Um, you know, maybe 18 years ago, when I first started doing that, my body was a lot more flexible. I have a new grandchild now who's only a year old, and when I want to play with him on the floor, I might think twice because getting down is not a problem. Getting up all of is. So my body is not nearly as flexible. Well, the same is true with our brains. Our brain is an organ, and it changes as we age. Um, it's got lots of information in it, and it's a wonderful uh, organ, but it loses a little bit of flexibility. So it may take us a little longer to uh, sort out information, retrieve information, and even encode it. We are slower to retrieve information, as I mentioned uh, before with the file cabinet analogy. Uh, as we are aware of our changes in memory, what takes just a few seconds seems much longer. When I'm having a hard time thinking of a word, that word may come in about three or four seconds, but that gap between thinking of the word immediately and that three or four seconds seems so much longer. We need to be a little more patient with ourselves and also with other people. Those of you who have older friends, neighbors, clients, be aware that they may just need a little more time to think through something. Uh, another example of um, the changes with, with age is the, um, the game show Jeopardy. Those of you who watch that will notice that they have a senior tournament every year. And the reason they do that isn't because seniors are not as bright as the regular um, contest contestants that they usually have, but they may be a little bit slower to press that button. Uh, after Alex Trevex finishes reading the, the clue. So um, James Holzhauer, who was one of the, the champions, and his reflexes are sharp. He, he would be much quicker at pressing that buzzer. So having a senior tournament allows people to have the same um, chance. Um, remember also that we can and we do learn new things. We tend to focus a lot on what we can't do. And I think it's uh, prudent for us to think about all the things that we have been able to do in far, as far as using our memory. Proof positive, there are 40 people signed up for this seminar who are using Zoom today. Two months ago, I would say that probably at least 90% of us may not have even heard of Zoom. So we can learn new things. Is it frustrating at times? Absolutely. But it's always been frustrating to learn something new. We have to be gentle with ourselves, give ourselves credit for what we are doing, um, learning new things, um, learning how to use a remote control. You know, a new TV requires you to learn a new remote. That some, is something that may be a little str struggle at first, but we can eventually learn how to use them. So that's real important. Next slide, please. So as we're trying to sort out whether what someone is experiencing is within the normal range or the beginning of dementia, it's really important to rule out possible physical causes. And I've listed a few of them here, and that's not a full list. I'm sure there are many others as well. 
I'd like to focus on a couple though. Uh, urinary tract infections are a really interesting um, that someone with a UTI may appear to have significant memory changes. I used to, to provide social work at um, new nursing homes in New Hampshire. And one of the first things that we would do when we would get a referral that somebody looked like they were having the beginning of either a major depressive episode or some significant memory problems is we had to train all the nursing homes to first evaluate for a UTI. Once a urinary tract infection was treated, amazing that the memory seemed to clear, the depression seemed to either go away or was never there in the first place, or at least um, be less prominent. Um, also, recent anesthesia. This is something we did not know uh, just a few years ago, that an older person who undergoes anesthesia may have symptoms of memory loss. M much of the time, that will resolve itself, but it may take as much as a couple of months. So before one has elective surgery, that's one of the factors that one might want to consider. Uh, B12 deficiency, and as mental health providers, we all know that depression and anxiety and other emotional issues sap people's energy. And when the energy is sapped, their ability to concentrate goes out the window. So these are things that need to be taken care of, taken into consideration. Next slide, please, Bonnie. So let's talk a little bit about dementia. I don't claim to be an expert on dementia. I have some 30 years of experience with seeing people in various stages, but that wasn't the primary focus of my practice. But I think for our purposes, because we really want to understand the difference between normal aging and dementia, we need to understand that dementia is not simply memory problems. It is a set of symptoms, and it requires that we pay attention to changes in many of these areas. And changing is important is an important word in, in this. Someone who has always had difficulty with language or thinking and reasoning is not necessarily someone who has dementia. We want to pay attention to some changes that have happened recently. So for instance, the ability to remember new information, uh, dates, uh, appointments. If this person always was on time for their appointments, they didn't have any problem remembering somebody's birthday and all of a sudden there's a, a stark change in that ability, that may be a sign of dementia. Um, forgetting somebody's name but being able to think about it later, later is more age-related memory problem. Uh, a person who doesn't remember uh, a neighbor, a fairly new neighbor's name, might be experiencing normal age-related changes. A person who doesn't re recognize their daughter certainly is more in the line of dementia. Language changes are also something to be watching for. The ability to speak, to write, to understand the spoken word. Um, a good example of that was a client that I was working with and you know he was being treated for depression and we were doing some fairly decent work. And then all of a sudden I started noticing that there was something a little different with him. And one day he came in and he said, I'm sorry I'm late because the, um, um, the, the, the thing on my, on my hand that, that tells me when I'm supposed to be somewhere didn't work. Him not being able to identify his watch was a pretty obvious sign that something was going on. And as it turned out, he'd had a stroke. Uh, it, was a, it was a TIA, it was minor stroke, but he'd had several in a row. And so there was a, a stark change in his language abilities. So that was one of the first things that we noticed. Um, for normal age-related change, we may not be able to think of a word, but 
you know, at three o'clock in the morning, you wake up and you say, oh yeah, that's what I was trying to think of. Um, visual and spatial memory are also important symptoms of dementia. A person who is no longer able to understand symbols, for instance, the, um, the on and off button on a computer, um, not a computer, but uh, a coffee maker. And that is even harder these days because a lot of our technology is void of words. You know, you have to figure out that that little green button is the on and off button. Well, if somebody was always able to do that and suddenly they're standing at the coffee maker and they just are frozen because they can't figure it out, that has to do with visual and spatial memory. Um, another good sign of spatial memory problems is people not knowing where they are in the, in, in the space that they're occupying. So oftentimes you'll see one of the first symptoms of somebody will fall off a chair or they're going to sit down and they miss the chair because their depth perception may be off. So these are things that we need to pay attention to. Uh, if somebody is no longer able to recognize that that red oxygon um, sign is a stop sign, that could be really dangerous, especially if they're behind the wheel. For normal age-related changing changes, you know, having cataracts might make your vision a little difficult, but that's something that can be corrected, and that is normal as far as aging is concerned. Thinking and reasoning, the ability to make lists, to uh, pay bills, to um, retrace your steps. If you misplace something, most of us who are not experiencing any stage of dementia may walk into a room, wonder what, why am I here, what, you know, I forgot what I, what I came in here for, but we can retrace our steps usually and regain our sense of, oh yeah, I came to do this or that. So thinking and reasoning skills are uh, another part of the set of symptoms that define dementia. Uh, not being able to find your wallet, um, you know, maybe uh, a, a sign of thinking and reasoning skills. And we'll talk about ways that we might curtail some of that in advance later on. Uh, social functioning is also a very big factor. Uh, people who have dementia, sometimes the filters that we have that prevents us from saying everything we think are uh, thinning, let's put it that way. Uh, a good example of that was, uh, and I'll use my, my own family as an example. My mother was in the uh, early stages of vascular dementia, and she was introducing uh, different people uh, at a family wedding. And she gave information about a family member that we all suspected or we all knew, but that nobody was talking about. Well, her filter was gone. So all of a sudden, she blurts out something that was very private and that she would never have done in normal circumstances. And the thing is, she wasn't even embarrassed because she didn't realize that she shouldn't have said this. So the, um, I won't go into details, that's a little too personal, but that's an example of um, the filters going away. Um, not wanting to socialize sometimes is a, is a symptom also. It becomes more and more difficult when you have dementia to interact with people. A lot is demanded of us in our social interactions. And so people may pull back because it's too much work and it's too difficult. Uh, some of us may choose not to go to a social event because we're not feeling up to it or it's, it's just too much work this particular day. That's different than pulling back because you don't have the ability. All of these symptoms are things that are disrupting normal life. So when you talk about dementia, think about these um, types of 
symptoms, but they have to interfere with our normal everyday life. Next slide, please. So there are a variety of kinds of dementia. In our society, we tend to hear the word Alzheimer's far more than anything else. And that's probably because Alzheimer's is the most common kind of dementia. 60 to 80% of people with dementia have Alzheimer's. And Alzheimer's is a progressive illness and it damages the nerve cells to the brain. So when those nerve cells are damaged, when they are choked by tangles and weaves and whatever else is going on in the brain, the information in that part of the brain is not available to the person. So no amount of coaxing them, you, you know this person, you've met, you've talked to her, if they don't remember, it's because they can't. So I think we need to understand that that is a kind of dementia and we need to be kind to the person who is experiencing that. All of these dementias are subcategories of the general term dementia. Vascular dementia is caused by damage to the blood supply to the brain. So a person who's had a stroke, a person who's had um, TIAs, uh, long-term high blood pressure, hardening of the arteries, all of that can lead to vascular dementia. And so damaged blood supply to the brain, those cells will die. Other kinds of medical conditions uh, include Parkinson's and Lewy body dementia. Those, in addition to all the other symptoms that people have with dementia, include motor functioning. And you'll see with Parkinson's, people get locked or they get very rigid. Um, so those, in addition to all of the other symptoms of memory loss, are more prominent with Parkinson's and Lewy body dementia. There's frontal temporal lobe dementia where the lobes of the um, parts of the brain are shrinking. And so, and usually this is in the frontal lobe where executive functions are, are more prominent. And so you'll see much more uh, loss of executive functions. Um, let's see, Korsakoff syndrome uh, is usually tied to long-term uh, alcohol use where the liver and the kidneys are not functioning, not enough oxygen is getting to the brain, and so you'll start seeing some kind of uh, changes with memory and functioning. There's also one other form um, that you may have heard of, and it's called mild cognitive impairment, and that is pre-diagnosis. These are problems with brain function that are noticeable, but they don't disrupt daily life nearly as much as these other diseases do. Next slide, please, Bonnie. There's excellent information all around, but there's a particularly good handout from the Alzheimer's Association called 10 Warning Signs. And we will be putting that up on our website um, it's, a, it's a worksheet, and I don't know if you can see this, but I printed it out. Uh, we will put it on our website along with the video um, in a few days. Give us some, some time to um, get these things posted. But it's a, it's a nice worksheet that goes through 10 different signs that we um, can look at to keep track of what's going on. Next slide, please. So the next steps in trying to determine whether what we're experiencing or seeing is related to dementia or normal age-related memory changes is to gather information. If you suspect any issues, your very first step should be to go to your healthcare provider, rule out some of those other issues that we talked about earlier, make sure you get complete blood work, a mental status exam, you want to rule all kinds of things out. Uh, review medications, because oftentimes people who mistake their medications may have symptoms that look very much like uh, dementia. 
So let's gather all the information, keep your records, you know, make notes, ask other people of their observations, document changes in mood, in memory and behavior. Again, don't only focus on memory, it's mood and behavior as well. Bring that information to your physician, to your healthcare provider, so that they can evaluate the whole person, not just that aspect of the person. Also, bring a current list of medications, including over-the-counter medications, because there are interactions with medications that can also uh, mimic memory loss. And it's a little easier these days with computers because most uh, medical practices have a um, medical record online. But if you're going to more than one doctor and they're not in your uh, primary care network, um, you want to make sure that your primary care has all the information that they, have, they can. And then advocate for yourself or for the person you're caring about. Get the answers to the questions you have. If you're not getting the answer that you're looking for, ask again in another way. Uh, I'm working with a client right now who surprisingly in her 70s did not know that she had the option of um, seeing another provider if she was not happy with her healthcare provider. She said, you mean I can fire my doctor if I don't like him or if I'm not connecting with him or if he's making me do something I'm not ready to do, um, I can fire him. And I said, yes, absolutely you can. Have a conversation. What is going on that is making you uncomfortable? Maybe it's something you can talk about. But if you find that you're so anxious going to the doctor because you don't feel heard, you absolutely have the right. So advocate for yourself, advocate for other people. So, next slide, please, Bonnie. Okay. So, part two is about the, the factors that influence memory. We get frustrated when we are not in control. That's very normal. Um, we have a desire to be in control, to have, and there's power in being in control of something. We can't be in control of everything, but there are some factors that we can control. And so that's where we're going to start with the next slide. Oh, the other way. <laughs> okay. And let's just um, do a little review, reminding you that the majority of older people do not have dementia. Slowing down is normal. And there are factors that we can do something about. It's also important that we pay attention to these factors so that we start at our best baseline so that if something were to go wrong with us, um, at least we know where we are today. And if we do an evaluation of the factors that may uh, make us at greater risk and we do something about that, we may delay the progression. We may um, be able to manage things a little bit better. And an, an example I want to give you about that is a, another client I've been working with recently. Um, she had really severe anxiety. And as I'm working with her around her anxiety, she mentioned that her husband has been diagnosed with early dementia. And part of her anxiety is what is going to happen when he can't be there and, and He's not going to be him anymore. And what we discovered in helping her reduce her anxiety was that these are things she can share with him. And so he's aware that he's having some memory problems. And so if he can learn to better cope with stress, if he can cope and learn to do deep breathing to calm himself, when his disease progresses, he will be in a better place to be able to handle the changes. It's not going to change the progression of the illness, but he may be able to deal with it better. So next slide, please. So these are factors that we actually do have control over. And for those of us in the healthcare field, some of these may seem 
repetitive and simple, but I think it's worth mentioning so that we at least do the best we can with what we've got. So let's start with nutrition. Um, you wouldn't expect to be able to drive a car if you didn't put gas in it, okay? Even though we don't have to put a lot of gas in our car these days, if we were to be driving, we would definitely need to put fuel in there. So the comparable for our body is we need to put good nutrition in our bodies. And many times people will say, well, I'm just not hungry. And that may be true. As we get older, if we're not as active, we may not be nearly as hungry. And if that's the case, then we have to be careful what we put in our bodies even more so. Uh, balanced meals, maybe smaller meals. Uh, pay attention to the food group so that you're at least getting proper nutrition. Fluid intake is also critical. Um, as we get older, our sense of thirst diminishes. And so if you've always waited to drink when you were thirsty, as you get older, you may not get enough hydration because your body is not telling you it needs it. And I have a, a quick hint for you that I learned many years ago and I found it to be quite true. If you, I don't know if you can see um, my, my hand right now, Pat, could you nod if, if you can see my hand? Because I can see you on the screen. Okay, good. If you pinch the top of your hand like this and you are well hydrated, when you let go, your skin should go down to normal. Now, you need to do this at various types, times of the day to find out what your normal is. But if you're not sure, checking this out is a good way of, of reassuring yourself that maybe you are getting enough or maybe you do need more fluids. You also don't need to only drink fluids. Water is best, um, but other fluids work well as well. That's redundant. Um, but you can also get some of your hydration through uh, fruits, you know, watermelon, cantaloupe, peaches, uh, oranges down here in Florida. How wonderful that we have available to us very good, not dry oranges, you know, coming from New Hampshire. It's one of the things I love about being down here. So make sure that you get enough fluids in your body. Uh, conventional wisdom is about three cups per day. If you're not sure, measuring, measure out three cups in a, in a pitcher and see how much you're actually using. And, you know, if you're having a cup of tea, um, then pour out from your pitcher the amount of tea you, you had. Remember that um, caffeine is a diuretic, so that may work against your hydration. Um, you know, you're allowed to have some, but it doesn't count quite as, quite as much, perhaps half. Uh, so hydration is really important. In our car analogy, to me, the hydration is like trying to um, drive the car without oil in the car. You know, it may go for a little bit, but it's going to cause some major damage down the road, literally. Um, general health and sleep. And this is where we were talking about sleep being really important. Uh, it really can affect our ability to concentrate, our ability to retain information, uh, especially cumulative. So really important to do something about that. Talk to your health care provider. Um, make sure that if um, the, the person who was talking, it's, I've forgotten the name, I'm sorry. Um, make sure that if he's able, if your husband is able to take little cat naps now and then, that may help with uh, some of the restorative sleep. Uh, it is a myth that we should never nap during the day because that'll throw off our rhythm. We need to get some sleep. And so if we can catch up a little bit with a 15 minute rest or nap, um, go for it. Uh, especially if you, know, if you have uh, the ability to do that during throughout the day. Um, let's see, general health can lead to low energy, which affects the brain's ability to concentrate. And you know, when, you're, when you're not able to concentrate, lots of things go by the wayside. Hearing loss. 
you know, when I was first talking about memory years ago, we never included that. And now we understand how very important hearing loss is to memory. If you are experiencing hearing loss and it is not corrected, you may only be hearing portions of conversations. While you're working so hard to keep track of the conversation that's going on, you're not hearing the next piece of information. So you're not going to be able to retrieve that. Oftentimes people say, well, I never, you never said that. Well, it may be that the person was there, they were in the room when that thing was being said, but their mind was still trying to process the thing before. So making sure that any hearing loss is corrected is very, very important. The second most important thing about hearing loss is that if one is prescribed hearing aids, they work best if they're in the ears. So many people get the hearing aids and they don't wear them. And so when you're not wearing them, they're not working. So it's really important. Uh, the, the brain is impacted by not being able to process information. And again, we, you know, a little further, we talk about social isolation. Well, if you're not able to understand a conversation, particularly in a group, you are more likely to socially isolate. When I was in grad school, we had a wonderful video that was shown to us. And uh, when I was um, teaching at the university, uh, I used to teach gerontology courses. And one of the things that I did was show that video. I wish I still had it available. And it showed uh, a family gathering over a meal. And it showed the, the level of conversation, you know, four or five different conversations going on at one time. And you could see the grandfather who at that time looked pretty old to me, probably is younger than I am right now, but I remember seeing him and you could see him tune out, that he wasn't able to follow the conversations, so he withdrew. And then people were laughing because he didn't seem to be part of the group. And so be kind, understand that there might be something going on that we're not aware of, and please get the hearing checked um, pay attention to wearing the hearing aids if these, they're needed, okay? Um, also, if the brain is not being used, it will shrink. So not being able to hear the auditory part of the brain may get lazy and it may stop working as efficiently. So another good reason to pay attention to that. Medication and chemicals, I, mean, I alluded to that before, you know, interaction of medications, over-the-counter medications, so important because oftentimes people will not tell their healthcare providers about the over-the-counter medications they're taking. Uh, I know that I always ask people for a list of their medication and also then ask them for any over-the-counter that they take and ask them why they're taking it because sometimes people think that a medication is for one reason and it may not be. Uh, a good example of that is, and I've had that happen at least three or four times in my practice, where I've asked people to give me a list of their medication, and then the over-the-counter, and they'll say, oh, they're taking St. John's Wort. And I say, and what are you taking that for? And they say, oh, that's supposed to help me sleep. Well, it's an antidepressant, and it may help them sleep. But if they're taking another antidepressant and their doctor does not know that they're taking St. John's Wort, you may be doubling up. The chances of adverse side effects increase geometrically. So really important to pay attention to that. Chemicals, you know, um, alcohol, uh, marijuana, um, CBD, all of these things are, um, can have a beneficial effect but the problem is they're not tested. We don't know what uh, other properties might be in them that may be interacting with things. So really important to have that conversation with your healthcare provider. You know, if you are choosing to use CBD oil, let your healthcare provider know. If that healthcare provider makes you feel uncomfortable and that you cannot have that conversation with them, that's a problem. And so, you know, being honest with your provider 
uh, they can't help you if they don't know everything that's going on. Uh, another underserved, pop, uh, underappreciated um, provider is your local pharmacist. They know the interactions of a lot of these medications. If you're not sure about something, you can ask the, the um, pharmacist, you know, make an appointment with them and say, could we go over these medications? They'd be happy to do that. Um, so let's take advantage of everything we have available to us. Um, also, um, with alcohol, just briefly, as we get older, our body um, water content decreases. And so the same amount of alcohol that we were able to consume very comfortably, you know, the, the two martinis uh, after dinner might have been fine when you were in your 40s. But when you're in your 60s, 70s, or 80s, that will go to the brain, go to the liver much more quickly because it's not being dissolved. Uh, it's not being uh, processed well. So really important to pay attention to the amount of alcohol we're consuming. And those of us who live in the villages know that you know, there's, there's a huge alcohol problem down here. You know, people just, you know, happy hour. There's no such thing as a happy hour. Happy hours go from three o'clock till who knows. Uh, so paying attention to that is important. Uh, standard uh, protocol for alcohol, if you are not on other medications, if you are not struggling with addiction, is no more than two drinks a day for men and no more than one for women. And I think we have to make sure that we um, think of that more in general terms. If you are a small man, the amount of alcohol that your body can uh, tolerate may be less than you know, the 350 pound uh, guy that's got lots more um, body weight. So keeping that in mind. And the final thing I'm gonna say about alcohol is even though we say two drinks a day for men and one for women, you can't keep it and save it up for all at one time and have you know, 14 drinks on Saturday. Not, not, good, not a good idea. Okay. Social isolation and boredom, we talked a little bit about that. Um, in that category, I go with the use it or lose it. You know, if you're not active, if you're not using your brain, if you're not interacting, if you're really down and um, not active at all, your brain will start to shrink. It will not serve you well. So some social act, uh, interactions are important. It's harder during this COVID time, agreed. But you know, fortunately, um, we are experiencing this in a time of technology, which allows us to be able to uh, at least interact with each other through Zoom or FaceTime, um, phone. I mean, imagine having this in the um, late 40s when not everybody even had a phone, how much more isolated one would feel. So that's important. Um, depression, and I'm speaking to the choir here, but depression, stress, anxiety, all affect our ability to concentrate, our ability to bring up the energy we need to use our brains properly. So please make sure that people get the help that they need. And one of the things that I found in my practice that once I had one person that was getting the help that they needed, um, in a family, once they saw how beneficial therapy was, um, they were the best advocates for their friends and neighbors to get help. So you, you help one person, there's a ripple effect that it may be helping others and empower them to share information that they've learned. One, one of the most gratifying things in doing the TLC work that I'm having is how many of my clients are sharing the tools that we work with, with their spouses and with their friends and um, making referrals to, to other people. And it's really gratifying because you're not only helping one person, but you're helping multiple people. And all of you in the field, I'm sure have experienced that at some point. Um, again, learning coping strategies, learning different ways of doing things are very important. Next slide, please. 
So asking for help is harder for some people than others. You know, all, all of my professional life, I have found that it is harder for men to ask for help than it is for women. But it is harder for a lot of people to admit that they need a little bit of help. Uh, think about asking for help as a sign of strength, not weakness. And if you evaluate the list of things that we just talked about from nutrition to stress and anxiety, and you see an area there that you could benefit from enhancing, one of the best suggestions I have is share that information with someone that you care about. Mm -hmm. They can help you stay on track. So if I decide that I'm not really getting the proper nutrition, um, I make a, a decision that I'm going to change my eating habits a little bit. Always do it incrementally. So I decide I'm going to add one more vegetable to my plate every, day, every meal. If I say this to my best friend that I often have lunch with or used to have lunch with and hopefully will again sometime soon, and I order something without the extra vegetable, um, she may say to me, whoa, whoa, what happened to your extra vegetable? Oh, yeah, okay. I'll have a salad with that, please. That can be helpful. Uh, if you want to make changes, doing it in uh, combination with somebody else who also may want to make a similar change. You can Again, the buddy system works really well. So do an inventory of all of the areas that might contribute to memory loss. See anything that you might um, be able to change. Write down your goals. If you write them down, you're more likely to achieve them or at least remember them. The, the mere act of writing it down, your brain hears it, sees it, has tactfully written it, you're more likely to remember it. Uh, little things, ask, you know, little things that you can do. Uh, for instance, if exercise is something that you're aware that you're not doing quite well enough, you know, start by parking further away from your, low, from your destination. You know, just parking your car on your golf cart uh, further away and walking to where you're going, there's a cumulative effect there. And you feel, you know, success breeds success. So once you feel positive about something, you're more likely to repeat it. Um, deep breathing, you know, we know that breathing deeply brings more oxygen to the brain. Who doesn't want more oxygen in your brain? It will function better. Build that into your day. You know, before I started this talk, take a deep breath, just felt calm, know, knew that my brain was thanking me for doing that. Um, shut off all electronics, you know, a half an hour to 45 minutes before you go to bed so that your brain has a time to calm down. So these are all positive things you can do for yourself. Next slide, please, Bonnie. So memory can be improved and it can be at least managed. So three points that I'd like to focus on. First of all, start by being the best you you can be today. If you were to have a stroke next week, wouldn't it be better that you are already doing all of these things that are good for your brain? You would be able to handle that change a whole lot better than if you hadn't paid attention to those things. So really pay attention to what you can do. Also, try not to define yourself by your illnesses. You know, you may have diabetes, you may have walking difficulties, you may have a heart condition, but that's not who you are. That is something you have that can be treated and dealt with. Don't let that get in the way of you being the best you can be in all of the areas we talked about. And starting with attitude. What you say to yourself, your brain hears. 
So if you are critical of yourself, if you are always dissing yourself, being uh, you know, negative, uh, surrounding yourself with negative people, uh, being exposed to negative news all the time, your body will respond as though this was happening to you at this moment. So your attitude around um, being good, being uh, as healthy as you can be, will serve you well. Try to be around positive people. You know, we can't avoid being around some negative Nellies, but we don't have to give them too much space in our head. You know, if, if I'm feeling down, I know a few people I can call that will lift me up very easily. And just by being a little humorous with, with ourselves, even just admitting, oh, gosh, I was really down on myself today. I got to stop that. And this person will say, yep, okay, what did you do? You know, and, and we might be able to lift my mood up. And I can do the same for that person. Uh, very important. Exercising your body and your brain. We talked about how important it is to be physically healthy. Well, the brain needs to be healthy, too. And we need to exercise the brain. We need to try new things. Um, challenge yourself. Um, use, use your brain uh, to be more aware of what is around you. Um, focus on learning something new. Uh, just, you know, sometimes even watching a TV program that you never thought to watch before. I remember years ago, um, someone had asked one of my professors, what's the best way to be better informed? Because this was something that we were discussing. And I, I'll never forget the answer. The, the professor said, read your newspaper regularly and you know, get a good quality newspaper. You know, your, your little local paper is good for finding out what's going on locally, but you need something with national um, headlines, national news. And read the articles that don't interest you. And I really thought about that, and I realized how often I would read all the things that I was already interested in, but I would skip over things that were not known to me that were a little foreign to me and I, that little voice you know 40 years later is still in my head saying read that article that doesn't seem to interest you you might learn something new and so I've, I've really tried to practice that stay focused you're not going to remember something that you didn't notice it's kind of a simple idea but if we're not paying attention to our surroundings, we're not going to take in all the data, all the information that we need. So be present. How wonderful it is when we can just slow ourselves down enough to be fully present and aware. My um, college um, mentor, I can't think of the word right now, I'm not sure where I put it, um, my supervisor, uh, my clinical supervisor, was such a great role model. When you were with Renee, it was as though you were the only person in the world. She gave you her full attention and wasn't distracted, you know, didn't. I, I remember one day um, we had our supervision, and again, I just felt like the most important person in the world. She gave me her undivided attention. And isn't that what we do as therapists? We give people our undivided attention. What a gift that is to people. You know, even before you do anything, you're giving them the gift of your undivided attention. Well, at the end of that particular day, I found out that Renee's dog had died that morning. And she was grieving the loss of this pet that she'd had for 14 or 15 years. But she didn't bring that into the therapy, into the supervision. And I always remembered that when I'm with a client, I leave me out the door. I literally picture myself out the door and I'm here for you right now. If we can practice that focus, that attention, our brain will really appreciate it. Sometimes we have to do mindfulness skills to do that. 
Um, so anyway, I'm looking at the time and I'm aware that I'm talking a little more than I intended to. Next slide, please. So I want to give you some real tips, things that you can take with you. Um, so important to be as organized as you can be. Your brain will appreciate the calm of being organized. Um, if you have less clutter in your house, in your office, your brain will have more breathing space. So even though it takes a little bit of work to be organized, um, it, it's worth it. My motto when I had a young family and I was going to school was don't put it down, put it away. And to this day, I remember that I had it on the refrigerator and it was for me to not put things down so that I wouldn't have to go back to that same thing and put it away to save some time. Well, we ended up as a family adopting that motto. And so it saved a lot of um, preaching. If the kids came home and they put their backpack on the floor, all I had to do was point to the refrigerator. They saw the sign, they put the backpack where it went. And all of a sudden there was less clutter and we found there was more time for us to be together, to, to have better conversations. You know, I would much rather talk about their day than tell them to put their things away or did you do your homework or you know do you have a routine being organized developing a routine always putting your keys in the same place frees your brain to not have to worry about that how much nicer for the brain to not have to worry about where your keys are where your wallet is um, making a list and always um, looking at that list so that you don't have to keep all of that information in your brain at all times. Um, Moni, we can go to, to no slide, if you would. And so there are other things that we can do to improve our memory. And one of them has to do with memory aids. And there's a word of caution that I need to give you with regard to memory aids. They are a good thing to use, but they can be a trap. For instance, um, it's really great, and I was supposed to have timed our, uh, our session, our question and answer session, but I forgot. But it's really nice to have a smartphone that you can look things up um, or set the alarm to tell you when something is coming up. But we can become a little overly dependent on them. So in order to improve your memory, if you're having a conversation with someone and you're trying to remember the name of the actress that was on Cheers and you just can't remember it, before you look it up on your smartphone, try to think about it. Give yourself time for that brain to go through all those file cabinets so that you might be able to retrieve it. That's exercising your brain. Nothing wrong with looking it up if you can't figure it out eventually, but don't, be, don't make that too quick a, um, a response. So memory aids includes the um, alarm clock on your on your phone, uh, a list of tasks that you might write down, um, a to-do list. Um, one of my favorite memory aids and when I was teaching I would uh, talk to my um, students about this all the time. If you even if you're in your 20s and all you're taking is a vitamin. Put it in a pill case. Starting to do that now will allow you to free your brain. It trains you to always do that. And so there are various kinds of pill cases. This one happens to be um, four times a day, seven days a week. And you can actually pull one of the days with you for, if you're going away for the day. You've put, you've put your medications in there. You can bring them with you. Um, really important. That way, if you were to start having some significant memory problems, you've already learned this skill. You don't want to have to learn it while you're having early dementia. So really, I, there's nothing, if you remember nothing else from today, I hope you come home, you come home, you're already home. I hope you take home the message of 
put your medications in the pill case. It'll serve you well. Um, Post-it notes, great invention, accidental invention, by the way. It was supposed to be a sealer for a, an envelope that didn't work, but what a great invention that was. Uh, don't be afraid to make notes to remind yourself. Uh, another note uh, technique that I love is painter's tape. I always have painter's tape in my, in my craft room. I have one in the kitchen. If I want to remember something, I'll write it on a piece of tape, put that tape on the dashboard of my car, if it's to remind me uh, that I need to pick up my husband's meds. Uh, again, it's, it's not to replace my own thinking, but it enhances that ability. So, you know, I put painter's tape on our pill cases to differentiate whose is whose, morning, night, Nick or Lou. Um, a simple little um, book, copy book, to make notes. Um, things that you want to remember, things that you want to do, things that you're hoping to do when you have time, when you're retired. Uh, notes to yourself, things like that. If they're in one place, it makes it easier to retrieve. So things like that are really important. Use all of your senses. If you're writing a grocery list and you write down the things that you need to buy, you are having the experience of writing, you're seeing it. If you're thinking it, it's another sense that you're using. Even if you forget the list at home, there's a better chance that you'll remember some of the items on the list. We talked earlier about challenging yourself, using you know, your brain in an area that um, you've not been used to using is really important for improving your memory. Um, breathing, we talked about that, increasing your oxygen level. And finally, be kind to yourself and be kind to other people. You are, next slide please, Bonnie. You're unique, you want to be open to change, you did not get to be your present age without going through lots of changes. Memory changes as we get older is just another change that we're going to need to adjust to. Build on what you know, build new things, but be yourself. And finally, the next slide, Bonnie. If you're concerned about your memory, Make sure you see your healthcare provider and rule out any physical causes. Pay attention to the things you can control. Get or stay active and keep those brain cells alive and be patient with yourself and others.